Welcome to the Accelerate Church television broadcast. We are so glad that you have tuned in today. Pastor Jeremy is teaching on the imminent return of Jesus. Such a powerful message preparing people for the return of Jesus in today's time. We believe that you will be strengthened, encouraged, maybe even challenged by today's message. Let's open our Bibles together and head into the sanctuary with Pastor Jeremy right now. Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. He rose from that grave, as we're celebrating this morning, to give us the ability to have that same resurrection power inside of our bodies. We ought to be excited. Yet I look around the body of Christ, and many of God's own children and people deal with things that he paid the price for them to overcome. And one reason so many Christians deal with things that they should easily defeat and overcome is because they don't really believe, number one, Jesus rose from the grave, number two, that he is coming back. You see, if you really believe Jesus could come today, you wouldn't have a problem forgiving and squishing the grudge that you've held for years. No matter how bad someone's treated you. No matter what anyone's done. If you truly believed the king of the universe was going to crack that sky today and appear in that sky and you were going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, there's some things you just wouldn't struggle with. That you permit to stay a hold and, and in your life because you don't believe in a doctrine called the imminency of the return of Jesus. And last week we got to looking at this, that there are quite a few people, in fact, I'll say it boldly, every person used to pen a book in the New Testament believed Jesus was coming in their day. And we already last week looked at Luke in Acts 1, you don't have to go there, but we're going to open the Bible in just a minute, praise God. But in Acts 1, Luke wrote about the imminent return of Jesus, where Jesus went up, remember, and the two angels were there, and they said the same Jesus, in like manner that he was caught up, raptured. Everybody say rapture. You see, you got to get used to these Bible terms. I had a well-meaning soul tell me you use too much Christian ease when you talk, too much Christian talk. Well, we are the church. You know, I, I would expect that if I went to China, I would hear Chinese. You ought to expect if you're going to walk into church, you're going to hear some Christian talk up in here. And rapture is a Latin word for caught up. Stay on track. Luke told us he's coming. Well, Jesus told us that. We'll look at that in a minute. James, the half-brother of Jesus, told us, the judge is standing at the door. His return is at hand. Paul wrote it several places that we shall not all die, meaning he thought Jesus was coming in his day, right? John and 1 John, we looked at all this last week. He was boiled in oil for the Lord. He was ended up being martyred. for. Well, he didn't die, actually. You remember, he kept living, went to the Isle of Patmos, lived to a ripe old age, actually. He couldn't kill the brother. <laughs> Couldn't kill him. Could not kill him. Well, he believed Jesus was coming in his day. Peter believed the day of the Lord is at hand, 1 Peter 4, 7. Remember that? This is a refresher. Are you all alive today? Are you awake? Titus must have believed it because we looked at this last week. Paul called him a good son in the faith. And Paul wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that the true grace of God that brings salvation will prompt you and cause you and honestly remind you to look for the appearance of our great God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I'm looking at all those, I'm thinking, well, everybody in this New Testament was living in such a way that they thought Jesus was coming in their day, and it just so happened that the world said they've turned the world upside down. But see, their perspective is wrong. They actually turned the world right side up. One reason for that is because... They had this as part of their heartbeat. Jesus is coming. I saw him go. He's coming back. And you know what? You came too late to tell those boys that he ain't coming. They believed he was coming. Do you believe he's coming? Well, as we looked at about 20 years past, two decades past, and so people were troubled because he hadn't come yet. So the first book Paul wrote was 1 Thessalonians, chronologically. In 54 A.D., he wrote that. Many scholars believe that was the date. And here's what he, he said, chapter 1, he's coming. Amen. 
Chapter two, he's coming. Chapter three, he's coming. Chapter four, hey, I've got the word from the Lord. Yeah. Those that are alive and remain will not precede those that have died in Christ, but we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, so we will ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But he said, I say this by the word of the Lord. This is doctrine. This is not opinion of man. You came too long, too late, long too late to convince me Jesus isn't coming. See, I've known it from the time I was a little kid. Jesus is coming. It's always intrigued me. I've sat through a lot of boring church services, more than most people in this room, except maybe Larry Brooks. Because he's been around a long time. I love Larry. He, he, he sits on the front because he wants me to make fun of him. And he told me that one time in a dream. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding on that part. I love Larry Brooks. He's an old time saint right here. Praise God, serving God. He's been in a lot of church. I've been in church since I was born. And the ones that would always cause me to sit at the end of my seat was I remember one guy came in preaching hellfire and brimstone, man. I, I was on the edge of my seat on that one. He was turned all red, sweat was going everywhere, veins popping out. Hell is real. And I mean, I'm like, I repent on the spot. I don't even know what I did, but I was ready to repent. Caught my attention. I wasn't sleeping on that one. But the other things that would catch my attention are when, are when people would start talking about Jesus is coming back. You see, there's something on the inside of me. I know it. And you got to know how much I know it. I named my first son born named Enoch because Enoch was caught up. He was translated. He shouldn't see death, right? God took him because he walked with God. 365 years of his life, he walked with God. Amen. I said, I got to name my firstborn son Enoch. Well, Philip came along next. Philip in the New Testament was translated. They were having revival services, church, kind of like what we're having now. And the Lord said, I need you over here to minister to a guy that's studying his Bible, doesn't know what to do, doesn't have a pastor, bless his heart. Sounds like a lot of modern-day Christians. Well, Philip, right in the midst of revival, all of a sudden was translated. He was there in the meeting. Next thing you know, he was approximately 30 miles away ministering to a guy who was sitting in a chariot saying, I need somebody to explain this to me. And here he is. Hello. <laughs> and, you know, the Bible doesn't even act like the guy was shocked. He's like, could you explain this to me? And then he's like, I need to be baptized. I believe in Jesus. And then the next thing you know, Philip is back at the meeting. Whoop, translated. Now, see, if that doesn't interest you, you're just too boring to even be here. Isn't that pretty interesting? Well, let me just ask you this. What's keeping you from being translated? Just a trumpet blowing and hearing the voice say, come up hither. That's all. What's keeping that from happening? There's a lot of prophecy that has to happen. Listen to me carefully. You could write books, the volume of which some would probably fill this room. There's probably been that many written of what has to happen before he puts his foot down on Mount Olives. But there's not one thing that has to happen according to the Bible for Jesus to be caught, to catch up his church, to appear in that sky, and to catch his church away. Nothing prophetically, nothing biblically has to happen. There's not one scripture left unfulfilled. In fact, I just got back from a conference where my pastor stood there and said, we're in overtime. What does that mean? This is just the mercy of God to reach souls. Well, we hope this word is strengthening and encouraging you today, and we're going to get right back to it, but we'd like to pause a moment to invite any of you ladies to our Women of Influence Conference 2023. This is coming up on June 30th through July 1st, and it's open to all ladies who are age 16 and up. We would love for you to be a part of our Women of Influence Conference at Accelerate Church. This year's theme is unsinkable. Did you know that your life can be unsinkable, unshakable, above the storms and the waves of life? God has that kind of stability in life for you. And we're gonna be sharing about that at our Women of Influence Conference. So if you'd like all the details, you can check out our website at acceleratechurch.cc. And we look forward to having you with us for the Women of Influence Conference 2023. People erroneously think, well, this is the age of grace. There's no command. That's ignorance gone to seed. Because it's the age of grace, you now have an empowerment to obey the commands. <laughs> it's not a cover for your rebellion. It's not okay to use the grace of God as a license to do whatever you want. You're not going to heaven if you live that way. You're going to burn eternally in flames hotter than you can imagine. 
See how quiet it gets when you bring that up? We're here to celebrate the resurrection. We don't want to talk about hell. Hey, he rose from the dead, so you don't have to go there. He made the only way of escape that there is for you as an individual. You better make sure you're following the risen way. Keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. I just have been blown away. I've been reading through the New Testament. I'm like, every book says something about Jesus coming back. Every book. And yet Christians act like, oh, you believe that, do you? Hey, I can't help it that the mockers have gotten to you and you've become one. But my king is about to appear in the sky. And I'm not going to be found in the mocking crowd. How about you, Miss Sue? No, you're not going to be in the mock. I forgot her name at the North Building. But I remembered it right now. I'll never forget it again, Miss Sue. I'm glad you're here. Praise God. You got to keep this commandment without spot, blameless until you feel like giving up. So you don't have a scripture for that. It, it, it never ceases to amaze me how Christians think they have permission to quit obeying Jesus. Where's that verse? You have no scriptural authority to quit obeying. Well, I've done it 40 years now, a little whippersnapper. Well, 40 years. Think of all the blessings that should be chasing you down of 40 years of obeying God. Why would you want to abandon all the blessings now? Because if you get off the obedient track, I don't care how old you are, what color you are, if you get off the obedient track, curses are coming to you. You obey God, you're going to be blessed. I'm sorry people have told you a different way. This is the way it's always been. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Now, I don't know why so many Christians have lost sight that we're in a fight. But you're going to have to fight to keep these commandments until you either take your last breath or the king appears. There's just no time for quit. Look at your neighbor and say, I'll never quit. Come on, tell them, I'll never quit. You're going to be tested. You're going to be tried. And many times that comes with hurt feelings. But hurt feelings are not a good reason to quit on God. Great peace have those that love the word. Nothing shall offend them. Nothing means nothing. There's nothing that can offend you. Now, see, some people think, well, you're a preacher. I know in the preacher world, did you know there's a lot of offended preachers? And when they preach offended, it gets and creates offended disciples. Now, I was preaching, and, just, and this is not an offended preacher that told me this, but I preached a, a message there uh, at this conference. Some of you, how many watched that, were able to watch that? Praise the Lord, several of you. I was able to preach on a Friday morning at Dr. Barkley's conference. And we went to lunch with a bunch of preachers, and one of the preachers looked at me, and, and you know, we're eating Cracker Barrel, man. We're about to eat a pancake. All is well in my world. I'm like, all right, give me some of that. I better stop talking about the food right now. I can tell you, some of you already starved, so. But anyway, hash brown casserole, mmm, man. Anyway, stay away from them potatoes, Pastor. You had not had no hash brown casserole, obviously. You, it's hard to stay away. Anyway, it's probably one of those commands of things I need to flee. We're sitting there talking, and this preacher looks at me. And he said, my goodness, you preached everything but the index today. I said, that's my typical MO. I preach Genesis to Revelation back to Genesis. I just rolled. I didn't think another thought about that all day long. And then pastor calls me before the evening service. I need to talk to you. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> kind of makes you perk up with just a hair. When the general says, I need to talk to you. Yes, sir. What is it? He said, this other preacher called me. He's real concerned because it just ate on him all afternoon about his comment he made to you. And he just wanted to make sure it didn't hurt your feelings. And I said, well, you'll have to remind me what comment he made. And he told me what I just told you. And I said, oh, I've forgotten about that. I said, pastor, I can't be offended. Why? Great peace have those. I didn't quote him that, but I had that in my mind. Great peace have those that love the word. Nothing shall offend them. But see, that preacher's been around the preacher world long enough to know that some preachers will get offended by that. In other words, I preached it all, everything but the index. Yeah, I know that's how you feel when you come here too. But you know what that means? That means you know a lot of Bible so you can go out here and live it. God didn't call me to give you one little scripture. One poem, three points, now go eat. 
Go feed yourself. After all, you hadn't skipped a meal all week, but hey, you got to go eat. You're hungry. Hadn't been to church in two weeks, but hey, you got to go eat. Preaching good now. This is a fight. What? To obey until the end. Never quit. Never, ever, ever give up. I urge you today, never give up. Jesus didn't do it. For the joy set before me endured the cross. The joy is what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday, that he arose and made a way for you and me. Yeah, he wasn't just stuck in the mully grubs and the, the terrible part of it. I watched the movie The Passion of the Christ. It's old now, but... I mean, if you haven't watched it, you need to watch it once. But, but I can't go back and watch that thing. It, it, I mean, rip my insides up to see my king. And then he did that for me. I haven't given him near enough of my praise yet. I haven't given him near enough of these breaths that he's given me and these lungs he created in my body that I had nothing to do with. I haven't given him enough yet. I haven't been radical, not even close to radical enough for him. I haven't yelled and screamed enough for my king. My, my, my. We got to remind ourselves of this. And all the way to the end, we got to obey. He's appearing or you're taking your last breath. Either way, you got to obey. We're in a fight. And that reminds me of Jude, the other writer in the New Testament that was a half-brother of Jesus. He said this in Jude 1.3. You've heard it before. I preached it a lot. Beloved. Anytime you see beloved or brethren in the New Testament, you should know this. When you rightly divide the Bible, that means it's written directly to you. So when you see beloved in this verse, you would be okay with God to just write your name right above that. If your name is Grip, you just write Grip. In other words, this is from the Holy Spirit directly to Grip. Directly to Hannah. Directly to Brittany. Directly to Andy. Directly to Jeremy. Directly to you, wherever you're hearing this right now. He said, I was very diligent. He wasn't lazy. To write you, to you concerning our common salvation. But I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly. That means fight with some passion for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, I'm just going to tell you this. If your Christian walk has no urgency in it, you're a dead man walking, a dead woman walking. Accelerate Church places a high priority on instilling God's Word into the heart of the next generation. Our kids' ministry is spreading hope by teaching the Word of God on a level that young ones will understand and take home with them. In Accelerate Kids, your kid will experience awesome praise and worship illustrated sermons from God's Word and interactive games in both big and small groups. Serving God is fun and we would love for your kids to join us at Accelerate. When you walk the aisle and you say, Jesus, be my Lord, this is not some little pansy, limp-wristed club you joined. This is the true fight club. And you're going to have to get some passion about this. Stop listening to voices that try to get you to lay down your attitude is what they call it. That's what the devil likes to call it. He's the one with the bad attitude. He don't want to obey God. First commandment he gives you in his dumb Bible is do whatever you want. Sounds like a lot of Christian preaching. Just do whatever you want. You do your truth, I'll do mine. It's all going to be good. No, it's not. It could be both of us split hell open. If our truth isn't based on the Bible, Whew. why earnestly contend? Why should we earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints? Well, I'll tell you why. Because Jesus is coming. That's why. If he's coming, there should be in us this tenaciousness to take on any person Anybody lost? Jude goes on to say here, men are coming into the church. I like one version says, they've wormed their way in. Unnoticed by many, and they turn the grace of God. Now, I don't know if you've had any fruit that's turned, but it's nasty. My youngest son turned uh, 22 months old this week. 
22 months, he loves fruit. He's pretty passionate about his fruit. He likes fruit more than anything else, and he loves grapes. And so the other day, you know, he's, he's learning to talk, but the main way he talks is, uh, uh, looks at me all bright-eyed, uh, pointing to these green grapes. I said, you want some grapes? Yeah. I said, all right. Washed him some grapes, pulled off a little stem, you know, it had several on it. And then when I looked at it, I thought they looked good. I didn't see one of them on there that had turned. Well, anyway, he eats those others. I mean, they're just disappearing like, I mean, hotcakes. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Faster than hotcakes at Cracker Barrel with a bunch of preachers. <laughs> one of those preachers sitting next to me, he said, you missed it. We were at Cracker Barrel one day. I went back to the kitchen and said, here, I'm going to pay you, cook. Give us some hotcakes every three minutes. He said, every three minutes they were coming out. I said, I'm glad I wasn't here that day. I'd be 500 pounds. My goodness. Anyway. My son's eating these grapes. All of a sudden, he makes a noise. I look over there, and he's got this nasty grape. It was, it was kind of brown looking. It's kind of mushy. Y'all want a mushy? This will keep you from what lunch for me talking about. He had that, and that thing was running down. I said, oh. And he was all. <laughs> and I knew it turned. But see, when you know the word of God, when you hear turned grace, you should have that same reaction as my little boy. But instead, now, see, it's become the norm. Because some dingling somewhere said, this is great. Grace can be a license for lewdness to do whatever you want. Oh, that sounds great. That's a good way to end up in hell. Grace is not a license to do whatever you want to do. Grace is empowerment to obey. If you would catch that, it would change your whole life. You know, grace is empowerment to obey. Well, Jude tells us about it. I won't read it because I preach that verse all the time in verse 4. If you've been here more than a couple, three times, you know I preach verse. It's one of my favorite verses. I mean, I have a lot of favorite verses, but that's one of my favorite ones because men have come in, changed the grace of God. Then Jude goes into, by the Holy Spirit, great detail talking about these men. They're like the foam of the sea, right? They're like clouds without water. I mean, you ought to read it. His whole book is only one chapter. It doesn't take long. But the Holy Spirit, through Jude goes into great detail explaining what these men will do, what they will look like. And look down in verse 14. I just want you to see this. We're talking about the imminent return of Jesus. And Jude right here says this in verse 14. He refers to one of my favorite Bible characters. It says, now Enoch, all the way back the seventh person. Adam was number one. Well, Abel was murdered. So through Seth's line, you see Enoch shows up as number seven. He was alive 308 years. Adam and him crossed, their lives crossed for 308 years before Adam died. And now Enoch was only on the planet 365 years. So the majority of Enoch's life, Adam was alive. I know that they talked to each other. I know, I know. The Bible doesn't say, but Adam was the one that lived in the garden when God would come in the cool of the day to fellowship with Adam and Eve, remember? So I guarantee you he wanted to pass those stories down. And there's something about Enoch. There was just something in him that he desired to walk with God right in the middle of a generation just like ours. And here now at the end, Jude, literally the book right before Revelation, the half-brother of Jesus writing to us like a man from another world possessed by God and the Holy Spirit, says Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. What? What men that are going to come in and turn grace? Tell you to eat a brown grape and just slurp it right down. And it's all good. What much worse than that? Because this has eternal consequences. And they're saying, hey, grace, God's so gracious. It's so good. Just live however you want. Of course, they're a little more slick than that. They don't just come and say that. But that's the conclusion you're left with. Let me just tell you something. You, you have to think about this. If the preaching you hear leaves you with the conclusion you can do what you want, it's from Satan. Even if the man's in a suit in a pulpit. Satan can appear as an angel of light. That should be a warning not to chase some spiritual experience, not to chase an angel. You don't need an angel to show up. You've got the Bible you had not even studied in two weeks. Jude said, Enoch. The seventh from Adam prophesied about these men. And here's what he said. Behold, the Lord comes. What's he talking about? 
The Lord coming. Did you catch that? Every writer in the New Testament writes about it. I haven't left one stone unturned here. You know Matthew talks about it. We'll look there if I don't preach myself out of preaching time. Mark talked about it. Luke talked about it. John talked about it. Now Jude talks about it. He said, behold, the Lord comes. He was referring to what Enoch said all the way back at the beginning. Adam's still alive. And he could see back beyond our day. Think of that. The Lord comes. I don't believe he's coming. Well, you disagree with everybody who's, a, who's who in the Bible. I mean, come on. He's coming with ten thousands. That means innumerable amount of his saints. What's he coming for, preacher? To execute judgment on all. Jude 1, 15. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. See, obviously, grace, those grace guys are saying, nah, you, can, you don't need none of that. Nobody's perfect after all. All have sinned. A half truth is all, equals a whole lie, so you better watch yourself. Because God's coming with ten thousands of his saints. You're supposed to be with him when this happens. <laughs> to, to execute judgment on all. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against God himself. Well, what do these men look like? Glad you asked. The Holy Spirit said, these men are grumblers. Sounds like a lot of church folk. Complainers. Man, it's so cold in here, I couldn't even concentrate. It's so hot, I don't know what you're thinking. You going to preach on hell again, preacher, or what? Why are you wearing a suit and tie? Why don't you dress down? And others, why don't you wear a tux when you're preaching? My goodness. It's like, you, you see what I'm saying? Grumblers, complainers. But check this out. According to is the set standard. They walk, they mean, that means they live according to their own lust. So whatever they want to do, that's what they do. Thanks again so much for tuning in with us to today's broadcast on the imminent return of Jesus. While that does conclude today's message, that does not conclude this message in its entirety. And if you would like to hear more, head over to AccelerateChurch.cc and click on the media tab. There you will find the rest of this series as well as other series preached by Pastor Jeremy. Or if you are in the Amarillo area, we would love to meet you in person. We're located at 4400 South Crockett Street here in Amarillo. Our service times are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. If you're not in the area, we would still love to hear from you. You can write us at info at accelerate.church.cc. We would love to hear from you, pray with you, encourage you. You can even give us a call right here at 806 806- 418-8913. We can't wait to hear from you and see you on the next television broadcast.